Welcome to today's webinar, School Bus Tech and COVID-19, Meeting the Challenge of a Modern Pandemic, presented by Synovia Solutions, a subsidiary of CalAMP. I'm Josh J. Lucio with School Bus Fleet, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. I encourage you to ask questions during the webinar at any point, and we will try to address them all. However, if we do not get to yours, don't worry, you will be contacted by email with a response after the event. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Brian Mitchell, Marketing Manager at Synovia, to introduce today's speakers. Excellent. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We know it's a highly, highly sought-after uh, batch of information that we're about to present because the challenge of the pandemic is so great and the uncertainty uh, so large. So we thank everyone for joining, and we hope that you can take away some valuable information uh, we've spent a lot of time preparing this presentation and being very thoughtful in the way we present it to you because we really want to provide information that will help you help your communities. With that said, we will get started. Uh, if, you're, if you're watching your screens now, you can see an image that I proudly took myself last summer in uh, uh, Cobb County, Georgia, when we were working with one of our customers at Synovia. And I like this picture because it's real. These are real families waiting for the real school bus that I was out spending the morning with and watching how they used our technology. And I think it's a great illustration of two things, of the uh, tremendous responsibility our industry has to keep children safe and to keep their parents feeling uh, comfortable with the way we do business. And secondly, with the incredible expectations people have today because of those handheld devices. I think we all know this uh, very instinctively and intuitively, um, but it's a great picture for me to remind myself that um, people depend on us to get their kids safe to school, and it isn't like it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, now they've got the ability to share information in real time with their friends and neighbors and to be much more communicative with school leadership and others and they are looking for the schools to use the same kind of technologies that other brands and companies and institutions work with. And I think you see that captured there really well in that image of just the simplicity that people are looking for in their daily lives. Uh, as we move to the next slide, it's an opportunity to um, essentially remind the audience, if you're not familiar with Synovia Solutions and our parent company, CalAMP, who we are, what we do, and why we feel we have a voice of authority and experience in this industry. Uh, Synovia was founded 19 years ago when GPS technology was still in its infancy. Uh, the iPhone was still six years away, and the idea of all of us having instant communication via texting and instant turn-by-turn -turn navigation via our smartphone and being connected uh, through social media was still many, many years away. And we were working on this technology since then, and we've, um, we've spent a lot of time with K-12 customers understanding their needs, their wants, their requirements, and really how difficult their job is and what we can do to develop software and hardware that serves them. We were acquired last year by CalAMP, which is a uh, largely a hardware provider, but has gotten uh, very uh, busy in the, in the software space as well. They've been around since 1983, producing technology around GPS tracking as well. They've got over 1,000 employees worldwide, and they are now receiving information from over 10 million vehicles worldwide. They've got a heavy footprint in Latin America and Europe, uh, and so we bring information and experience, both from our 19 years at Synovia and now with CalAMP, the global experience they bring uh, on the telematics and GPS tracking side. A lot of you know us for our most popular product called Here Comes the Bus, which proudly last November passed 2 million users, uh, about 500,000 daily users when school's in session. And we still maintain a 4.6 star rating on the Apple App Store with 65,000 reviews, thanks in large part to you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers, parents and babysitters and grandparents and even students themselves who use Here Comes the Bus to provide real-time school bus tracking. And then we just launched Bus Guardian last week, and we'll talk a little bit about that as this presentation goes on. 
But Bus Guardian is calling upon some of the same technologies that Here Comes the Bus uses in terms of real-time GPS tracking to deliver a solution focused on the COVID challenge, which, as you all know, is complex and, and pretty difficult for all of us to wrap our heads around. Um, but we didn't want to just bring the Synovia expertise and the CalAMP experience uh, to this conversation. We wanted to deliver uh, information that was diverse and came from a wide range of uh, perspectives. So on this call, we've got um, several folks who've got a lot of experience, the first being Josh Crosby from Higley uh, Unified School District in Higley, Arizona. Um, around our building, we call him a super user because not only does he use all of our technology, but he uses it to a very high level and is extremely precise and focused in delivering a excellent customer experience for his community. And he's gonna speak about um, how he uses school bus tech and specifically how he's repurposed it around the COVID challenge. Uh, Brooks Burks is joining the call as well. He comes with a wealth of experience as well. He's a former army officer uh, with a background in transportation who has since uh, moved into the consulting world and has been very busy helping school districts across the country think about how they're going to overcome the COVID challenge. And then finally on our team, Brad Bishop, who was one of the original founders of Synovia 19 years ago. He has spent countless hours uh, in the garage, in the yard, in the offices of transportation directors over the last 20 years and truly understands uh, the world through their eyes as, as well as almost any vendor can out there. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Josh to speak with a little more detail about his background at Higley. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's good to be here. Um, I know things are a little unique under this uh, situation with COVID, and I think networking uh, all across the nation is a, is a great thing. Um, like Brian said, my name is Josh Crosby. I'm the Director of Transportation for Higley Unified School District. I've been in student transportation for 23 years. 20 of those years have been at my current district, which is Higley. Uh, I began driving a school bus back in college and worked my way up, and it kind of got in my blood, as I'm sure it does to many of you guys. Interesting notes about Higley. Um, it was a small farming community. We only had 371 students and seven buses when I started there. And now we have over 83 buses and over 15,000 students. Um, our district was uh, the fastest growing school district in the state of Arizona for five years. So many of our cornfields and dairy farms quickly disappeared and made way for new homes, which as you can imagine was a challenge for transportation when we were getting 20 to 30 new students enrolling every week. Our boundaries and routes were always changing and we were continually opening up new school campuses. Uh, the Higley School District has always been on the forefront of technology, not only in our classrooms, but on school buses as well. Uh, we were the first school district in the state of Arizona to incorporate student tracking and have the mobile data tablets on our buses. Uh, our Higley School District is actually running some buses right now with special needs students taking them to summer school. And uh, we are a year-round school district with school resuming on July 27th. So we've kind of had to escalate some of our COVID response plans and uh, prepare for the start of new school year uh, probably much sooner than many of the other districts across the country. So with that, thank you inclu for including me uh, in this discussion. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to turn it over now to the next slide and allow our in-house expert, Brad, to start to speak about some of the uh, challenges around COVID. Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning on the West Coast. Um, appreciate your time and, and what you all do. As Brian mentioned, I've had the privilege of working with uh, thousands of school districts for about, gosh, 20 years. And uh, I tell you, you guys have a, a extremely difficult job that frankly uh, is about to get, is getting a lot more difficult, right? Um, we don't have all the answers. Uh, I want to <laughs> set your expectations properly. We definitely don't have all the answers, uh, but we do, uh, we do our best to listen and think through, you know, what we're hearing from our customers, from you all, and we're trying to bring that to, uh, to bear today. So this is what we know. 
I'm not going to read this to you. I'm hoping and assuming that you have read this. This is the, the CDC guidelines. Uh, you know, I look at this and, and I see things like six feet apart on a school bus. I see sanitization um, after every route, run, trip. Uh, I see, you know, putting physical separation between, you know, students and, and stickers and so forth. And I think, man, that's that's not easy, right? Um, I have a house full of kids myself. I can't keep them six feet apart from themselves, from me, uh, let alone <laughs> on a school bus. So uh, all that being said, you, you all definitely have a challenge ahead of you, and we hope today to, to shed some light on some things that we can do. So there's three chapters to this story. Uh, as you can see there, the, the first priority always is student safety, right, and, and driver safety as well. Uh, we know that the driver uh, population, you know, most uh, most fall in a category that uh, might be considered high risk, right? So we want to make sure that, that we can do whatever we can to keep the driver safe, the kid safe, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. The second piece, communications. So as Brian mentioned, parents' expectations are very high, and uh, if you think they're going to get a little bit higher this fall, you're probably right. Um, having a house full of kids myself, uh, you know, we uh, we try our best not to be helicopter parents, but, you know, there's the 4-year-old and the 8-year-old and the 10-year-old and the 13-year-old and the 15-year-old. So at some point, there's some helicoptering going on. Um, but today, we want to talk about how to help you all improve communications with parents that, uh, again, will probably be a little more anxious than they have been in the past. And last but not least, route management. So when you think about social distancing on a school bus, uh, six feet apart, that, that 77 passenger bus probably won't have 77 kids on it, if I had to guess. So what do you do to to effectively route those kids safely? How do you make sure they're on those routes? How do you make sure they're on time? Um, and all the things that you would have to do normally, but now in a more uh, enhanced environment. So a few other recommendations on there that you can see, thanks to School Bus Fleet, I pulled this from their website, uh, you know, of all the things that, that come to bear Cleaning, disinfecting, um, social distancing, masks, you know, hand washing, we're all familiar with that. And that tough one, increasing distance between students, uh, one student per row, every other row. That's a tough one. So we're going to tackle these three challenges today, and we're going to start with student and driver safety. So uh, the first piece we'll talk about is student and driver contact tracing. So at a high level, what we're talking about there is uh, knowing which kids are getting on which buses, when and where. So students scanning on and off a bus, having that information at hand, being able to trace that if we need to, especially if a student becomes ill. So we're going to talk about that. We'll also talk about sanitizing buses. And actually, uh, Josh is going to share a little bit about his experience thus far, uh, obviously having a lot more experience than, than any of us on the phone here uh, on our side. So Josh? Thank you, Brad. Yeah. Uh Cleaning and sanitizing buses is something that I'm sure we've all thought about and probably all done in the past, just never to the extent that's going to be required of us moving forward. Um, and like I said, at Higley, we're kind of on the fast track with school starting relatively soon, and, and I just wanted to share a little bit of, of some of the obstacles that we've come across and some of the successes that we have had um, as it comes to sanitizing buses. Um, it's obviously not as easy as it seems. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be considered. Are the chemicals safe that you're using on the bus? Do they have any strong scents, perfumes? Do they contain dyes that might uh, have an allergic reaction to some of the students on the bus? Something that uh, to consider as well with the chemicals that you're looking at using is what is the COVID kill time? Uh, many of them are 10 or 15 minutes. Some go as low um, as one minute with a quick kill time. It's important to know that the, the chemicals that are applied with, say, a five-minute kill time have to physically stay wet and damp on the um, surface for that five minutes in order for it to actually kill the COVID virus. Um, other things that we looked at in our district was we purchased a number of different chemicals and, and set up a, a test bus for each one just to see if the spring left any residue on the seats or if it damaged the seat vinyl in any way. Um, so that's a, a good consideration if you're going to be spraying a bus three, four, five, six times a day, uh, what is the effect that chemical is going to have on the bus? 
Another consideration for us is chemicals being carried on the bus. Um, does your state allow it? Um, an option if you're not able to physically carry the chemicals on the bus is maybe to have it kept at the schools and have uh, someone at the school bring it out to the bus base so your drivers can use it. Um, flammability is another thing. Make sure your chemi chemicals are not flammable. Uh, track and log the times of when your buses are sanitized. Um, find a product that doesn't need to be wiped down after it's sprayed. I think that'll save a lot of time in the sanitation of the bus if you don't have to go back down and wipe the seats after uh, it's been applied. And probably the, the largest concern is can you even acquire these chemicals before school starts? Um, so you need to start thinking now um, on availability of these products. In Higley, we tested uh, a myriad of products and, and ended up settling on a hydrogen peroxide-based cleaner. Um, hydrogen peroxide is the active ingredient, which is relatively safe. It's odorless, colorless, and, and has a five-minute kill rate for COVID. Uh, some of the struggles that we have in Arizona with our warm temperatures in the valley, and it is uh, supposed to be 111, I believe, here today. So. I'm jealous of the weather that some of you have across the uh, nation right now, but if we spray the seeds, how quickly will the, the chemical evaporate in the heat, especially if we have to keep them damp for the five minute kill rate? Um, another unique issue for the hotter climates is your air conditioning systems. Most school bus air conditioning systems use 100% recycl uh, recirculated air throughout the bus. So we are actually considering uh, operating our buses with some of the windows lowered, even with the air conditioning on, uh, just to increase the fresh air intake into our vehicles. And um, lastly, uh, for those in the warm climates, um, anything above 133 degrees will kill the coronavirus after 15 minutes. So we um, are parking our buses in the sun with the windows up, um, just as a secondary precaution, I guess, to help increase the temperature inside the vehicle, which may kill the virus as well. Um, some of our studies uh, that we've done in, on our buses, we have found that using a garden style pump sprayer, using the hydrogen peroxide uh, chemical, we are able to sanitize an 84 passenger bus in just about three minutes. Um, so that's kind of the direction we're gonna be going. Um, and I just think some important points to keep in mind as you select your products and, and figure out what's best for your school district. I think it's uh, important to make sure you check with all your state guidelines and obviously your, your district policies as well to make sure that uh, it works well for you, so. Uh, Josh, thank yeah, you very yeah. much. We, we said we were going to bring an expert, and obviously you could hear the expertise and the amount of research they've conducted. We'd like to turn over to Brooks now to speak briefly about uh, the research they've done and the consultations they're making around uh, social distancing. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So, you know, first of all, with, with the social distancing, uh, whether or not your district will elect to social distance on buses or not, it, it is the most significant determining factor in, of, of the overall impact to your operation. So. That's first and foremost, what is your district going to do? Um, social distancing overall will drive the number of buses and drivers needed, which are clearly the foundation of your operation. So the earlier the district can make a determination of how it will be engaging the social distancing, the quicker the planning can begin. And really, right now, the time is running out. A lot of school districts have already made some decisions and have some considerations for social distancing. Uh, we've seen I've seen three, three main scenarios so far uh, from, from clients. Uh, first uh, would be no social distancing. There are some locations or some districts that are looking at that as an option. Um, the second would be social distancing with uh, masks on buses, and that would involve one student per seat alternating left and right positions. And then you have without masks, full social distancing, one student seated every row alternating sides. So if you break that down, using a 56 pass passenger bus as an example, if you're going to social do full social distancing without masks, you're, you're limited to seven students on that bus. And if you implement with masks, 
and limited social distancing, then you have approximately 50%, or you could probably fit 28 students, approximately 28 students on that 56 packs bus. Um, so that's that's the scenarios that we're seeing. I think it's being left down to the uh, the school districts a lot to make these final decisions. So I think that um, just being aware of that and making sure that you're kind of communicating up the chain that these decisions uh, need to be made soon. Excellent, Brooks. Thank you very much for that. We're going to move on now to dig a little deeper into contact tracing and the role it can play in the COVID-19 challenge. That's for Josh over at Higley. Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, who would have thought two or three years ago when we were uh, rolling this out with Synovia that, that we would actually be considering using uh, using this for contact tracing? But it actually works out really well for that with uh, very little modifications. Um, so at Higley, we've been using the Synovia products for several years. All of the students in our district uh, from grades K through 12 scan either a student ID, a bus pass, or their cell phone uh, when they get on and off of our buses. This was our policy prior to COVID, and it's something that we plan on continuing uh, into the next school year. What's really nice about this is every time a student scans at the entrance uh, of the bus, their parent will get an alert that they have boarded the bus, and we also get a timestamp of where they got on the bus, what their name is, um, what time they got on the bus. Uh, so we are able to essentially track all that information. Um, looking at it from the perspective of contact tracing, we can see day by day who rode the bus, and how many students were on the bus. We can even sort the data by timestamp and uh, time of day and see actually who scanned in front of that student and behind the student as well. Um, so we're able to uh, use all of that information for contact tracing um, should we need to identify a student that may have the virus and who else may have been exposed to it. Um, just on a side note, if I can uh, sidestep for a minute, I get a lot of questions about kindergarten and elementary age students and them holding on to a bus pass or being able to scan. Um, and that was a concern of ours when we first started it. But just a, a side story, we ended up purchasing lanyards and mailing out the bus passes to all of our students. And I was actually at the grocery store on a weekend on a Saturday and saw a little boy wearing his bus pass. He was maybe seven or eight years old. And so I asked his mom about it and she goes, well, he absolutely loves it. It's like a credit card to him. He loves the beep when he gets on and off the bus and, and he'll never take that thing off. So. Um, it rolled out really successful for us. There obviously was a learning curve, and we had some delayed boarding in the beginning as students got used to it. But uh, now that the students have been trained and they do it on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's pretty much seamless. And uh, I think it'll work out well should we need to uh, use any of that information for contact tracing. Thank you, Josh. Can you speak briefly around the ability of the tool to help you model who is actually riding the buses so you can do, you know, accurate route management? Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the back end in our office here, we're able to um, see daily how many students are on each bus and who those students are. Um, so it does help us modify our routes and, and hold our efficiency patterns um, as we need to. And um, you don't have to rely on getting information from your drivers or walking out to the bus to look at their actual count sheet. Um, you can pull all that data remotely. Um, the other neat thing is at any given time, you're able to see exactly who is on that vehicle in real time uh, from the office, which is a nice feature as well. Um, particularly if there ever was a, an accident or a bus breakdown, you'll know exactly how many students are on that particular bus at any given time. Excellent. Thank you, Josh. Uh, to, to, to the point Josh made to open up, um, I think a lot of us have heard of contact tracing as it, re as it relates to, you know, public health officials tracking down uh, ill individuals and the people they may have come in contact with at work or at church or at the grocery store. And we've seen it as well in mobile apps that Apple and Google are working on. 
uh, we want to make it entirely clear that you know this solution is not tracking a student when they're not on the bus, right? We're not trying to to do the kind of things that Apple or Google are doing with the app and track a student all the time. This is more about uh, should a, a student become ill and a, a school health official wants to know with great clarity, okay, where was that student in the classroom from periods one through seven, and which bus did they ride on? So I can find the dozen or so students who you know, were with, within close proximity to them for any extended period of time throughout the day. Um, to Josh's point, we could have never imagined this technology would serve this purpose, but we have already have uh, several customers who have uh, you know, adopted this technology uh, for that purpose as they approach summer school and going into the fall. Uh, as we move on, we're going to talk a little bit about bus sanitization and how you can go beyond just the actual uh, efforts that Josh detailed in the chemical selection of the application, but actually tracking it, monitoring it, and reporting on it intelligently. Thanks, Brian. So this is this is Brad again. So you heard from Josh. There are, are various methods of sanitizing the bus. You know, depending on how you want to do that, and with what types of chemicals, and you know, what are we really going to require of the drivers? Um, you know, to keep the kids safe, to make sure the, the bus is clean, but also within reason, right? So, you know, we looked at our technology that we already had with the tablets, mobile terminals on buses and said, well, wait a minute, you know, if, if drivers and aides are going to have to do this work, they're going to need a checklist, uh, number one, to make sure they cover everything, and number two, you know, you in the front office are going to want to make sure it's being done, right? So everyone's familiar with pre-trips and post-trips, you know, they've been, they've been out there for a long time. But this is a new twist on that. So each district will be slightly different, you know, state by state, county by county. Um, it's not going to be the exact same. So we, we offer to you all the ability to customize your list. So whatever that checklist happens to be, let's make sure it's on the tablet. Let's make sure the drivers are doing it. You'll get a timestamp. You'll know who did that. You'll know when. Uh, and just imagine, you know, the, the impact this is going to have on, you know, keeping track of all that information. Right, so God forbid a, a kiddo gets sick, you know, we're going to have to look at who else was he in contact with, was the bus clean, when did that happen, who else was on that bus, so all these things kind of play together. Uh, but at the end of the day, we hope to, to provide a pretty simple and easy tool for your drivers to get the work done and to keep it documented. Uh, Josh, you've obviously been using this technology for a little while now, um, pre-COVID. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you've used it kind of before and, and now that uh, we have this in front of us? Yeah, absolutely, Brad. Um, yeah, as you said, we have been using uh, the product for our pre-trips and post-trips for many years now. Uh, just to jump on something you said there that I think is important, what I really like is that as a district, we're able to use the exact words and verbiage that we want to appear on the tablets and create as many post-trips or pre-trips that we want and be as detailed and have the menus drill down as much as, as we want uh, for our district. So that's worked well. Um, as I said, we've done pre-trips, abbreviated pre-trips, post-trips, uh, student checks in the past. Um, we recently added bus washing and bus sweeping to the post-trips. And then just recently, even more recently, I guess over the summer, we added the bus sanitization process for our drivers. And currently we are using that on our sped buses that are running over the summer. Um, one of the things our drivers really like about it is they are able to log into the tablet and go back in the history and they can see when the last time the bus was sanitized, um, the exact date and time. Um, same thing, they can see if the bus has been pre-tripped already and, and who did it and if they found any violations with it. Um, so it, it's helpful not only for the office staff but as well as the uh, other drivers. That's excellent. And, and, and Brooks, can you talk a little bit about the second and third order consequences around social distancing? Because it's not just as simple as, as the spacing. There's a lot to think about uh, before we move over to our first Q&A section. Right, right, Brian. So once you determine your social distancing policy, really, and I'll say unfortunately, that's when the tough planning starts. So. Uh, that's step one. Uh, what, what are we going to do with social distancing? The trickle-down effect of your school district of your school district's decision will impact almost every aspect of your organization. So if you think about it, 
all your a lot of your policies, both internal and for customers, will need to be reviewed, updated, communicated, and in some respects trained trained on. Once decisions are made about your ability to transport students and how how many students you can transport, tough decisions are going to be made about who is eligible to ride the bus and who is not eligible to ride the bus based on your COVID policies. This will require, I, I believe, extensive communication with parents. And um, also, you'll have to be making uh, adjustments to your routing system. So if you think about the impact of uh, COVID, one of them is, you know, we, we talked about the bus sanitization. So now, when you drop students off, there has to be time to break to clean the bus satisfactorily in accordance with your new uh, SOPs. And so that time has to be back into your, your routing system, whatever you're using, right? You have to go back into there. You have to look at your routes. You have to update the routes based on the new uh, information. And that, and also just kind of continuing down that path, uh, and I mentioned earlier is training. So all the things that you're going to be reviewing and updating in terms of who's allowed in the facility, what happens if there's uh, a second wave, what, you know, these different considerations, oh, the, the staff need to be trained on in time. There needs to be time for staff to learn how to perform these new tasks, understanding what they are. And then, you know, the, the, the drivers are going to be the ones that are going to be communicating a lot to parents and the parents are going to have a lot of questions. So, how do they handle the, How do you handle that? So, just that one decision really there's a trickle down effect across the organization. A lot other uh, work starts once you have that laid out. Excellent, Brooks. Thank you. And and I think uh, the points well made there by Brooks that you know all of these decisions have almost a domino effect onto the next. And I'm seeing in some of the questions coming through around the domino effect of you know the the need to social distance or the requirement and how it could lead to just a lack of busing outside of special ed we had a question or a statement come in around the elimination of all busing outside of special ed which you can imagine would would drastically change the landscape of a transportation department uh, we want to move on right now to our first question and answer session and not make everyone wait to the end because we've got a lot of great questions coming in uh, Josh, if you're ready, we've, we, your, uh, your uh, uh, great research there on the sanitization efforts prompted a lot of really smart questions. So I'm going to turn uh, three uh, over to you. So one at a time, Josh. They are, uh, during sanitizing procedures, are you sanitizing windows, walls, seats, and floors? And are foggers sufficient? Uh, great question. We are doing all services that would be touched by the students, um, but in our district, we are um, having the students not operate the windows. So that would be one less thing that we would uh, be having to sanitize. But we would be doing all the seats, all the handrails, uh, the driver's compartment, um, and the steps up in and out of the bus. So we've got another question here that comes might come from our part of the world where uh, we don't suffer from these uh, uh, horrible uh, summer temperatures, but we do get some pretty uh, dreadful winter temperatures. And the, temp and the question is, any idea how to sanitize a bus when the temperature drops below 32 degrees? I know it's interesting for Higley in Arizona. <laughs> uh, will the products freeze upon contact with the surface? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would definitely... Consider that when you're looking into a chemical and, and work with your janitorial supplier for that. Um, in Higley, we have the exact opposite um, storing chemicals above 120 degrees. So we have the exact opposite effect, but I have not uh, done any research on the, the freezing temperatures of any of the chemicals. And and without you uh, doing an actual uh, brand promise here, people are asking what specific brand of hydrogen peroxide and the dilution ratio that you're using. So what we've been purchasing comes in one-gallon bottles of concentrate, and each gallon will make 64 gallons of ready-to-use product. Um, we are getting it. I, I mean, I guess I don't know if I if I can say what vendor we're purchasing it from or how you'd like to do that. Um, 
but I could certainly do that if you'd like. Yeah, let's let's pause on the vendor name. We've got the uh, for everyone out there listening patiently. We've got all your uh, emails, and we will send these questions to Josh, and, and maybe he can respond to you independently with the name of the vendor that he's working with uh, to secure these chemicals there in the Greater Phoenix area. Um, Josh, next question is. Um, just to make sure we're clear on this, you, you, you spray the seeds and you let it sit for five minutes and then you wipe them down? Uh, partially correct. Um, the thing I really like about this chemical is it is odorless and dye-free, and it has right on the, the claim of, from the company is it leaves no residue and no wiping is needed. So we are spraying the bus uh, using a garden pump type sprayer. Um, we're using little half gallon sprayers right now, but you can get the same thing like in a backpack sprayer. You may see like a landscaper using um, spraying the seats down. In Arizona, they do dry uh, relatively quickly, so even though it's not required, we don't have to wipe them down. The seats are dry before the bus gets to the students. Um, and the chemical just sits on there for five minutes. It has a five minute kill rate um, according to the uh, vendor. That's excellent. And then one last question, Josh. You haven't covered this, but I've seen this in the media, so it is, uh, I think, on people's mind. UV lights. Have have you guys explored that at Higley at all? We have not. Um, I think primarily because of the cost and the availability. In our district, um, we are going to make an effort to sanitize each bus after every bus load of students. Um, and we do triple runs in the morning and triple runs in the afternoon. Currently, the drivers only have a five-minute downtime period between their runs. Uh, we're looking at increasing that a little bit, obviously, but um, in order to sanitize 80 buses within five minutes when they drop off at all the schools, uh, we've got to have something that, that's uh, cost-effective that, that can be done at each school bus, uh, bus bay. Wow, excellent answer. Um, over to Brad, we've got some questions on the technical uh, specifications around the bus guardian and the contact tracing, you know, what we probably know of as in the industry is student ridership, but in this case it's going to facilitate the contact tracing. Um, special education students who might not be able to scan on and off and come in a wheelchair, how does that work? Yeah, great question, uh, and we certainly uh, understand the, the need for that. Um, lots of customers uh, currently are tracking their special needs kids without actually having to scan on and off. So the, uh, the tablet, that same tablet that can help you with your sanitization checklist, can also have a passenger manifest. And what most of our customers will do is uh, either the driver or an aide, if there's an aide on that bus, can log the student on from the tablet or the MDT rather than you know having a student have to scan on and off. So um, they can do it directly from the device, uh, which also helps. Uh, I know we got a few other questions in there about what if the student doesn't have their ID, right? Um, which, by the way, that's the hardest part <laughs> of student ridership is asking 5, 10, 30, 50,000 kids to, uh, <laughs> to bring their cards on the bus every day. You know, I can't get my kids to bring their homework in or, you know, put two shoes on. Um, but, yeah, so it's it's nice because the tablet also uh, allows the driver or the aide to log that student on as well. And, and Brad, if I could just – this is Josh. If I could just add something to that, Brad. We um, actually found with our special needs students, particularly the ambulatory ones, the um, – Parents and teachers like to have the special needs students scan off and on and off the buses as well, um, saying that it helps promote and teach them life skills that they may need uh, later in life. So just kind of a side note there. Oh, thanks, Josh. Yeah, I didn't realize that. That's a, that's a great point. You know, definitely having the, the kids participate probably gives them a little, little boost in confidence. Yeah, it's, it's a, a tremendous challenge for every parent out there with special needs kids. So I think that's a great point of allowing this to be a teaching moment for a lot of the, the challenges of real life that they'll face out there. Thank you for that, Josh. Brooks, um, there's a lot of questions in here around CDC guidelines and recommendations. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, that term, guidelines and recommendations, when you sit down with your customers, how are you guys helping superintendents and school boards and elected officials and these high-level uh, folks who be outside of transportation think about these CDC recommendations and guidelines 
uh, versus um, edicts or you know hard policy or law perhaps. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, Brian. Uh, what we've seen here over the last couple months is uh, a bit of confusion about what is required versus what is recommended. So we're trying to help clients kind of sift through that and focus on what is actually being uh, dictated and very little right now is being dictated, but we're trying to focus on what is a guideline? How can you incorporate that guideline into your specific situation? Or do you not, or or does it not fit? So I, I think there has to be kind of a, a review of the data and assessing what impacts your organization. So um, the CDC guidance, you know, it, it, that we talked about at the front of the presentation is just that. There's no mandate in there. It's giving you recommendations. So um, you know, it, it comes back to working with your school district and your leadership to make sure that you're defining what is a mandate versus a guideline and eventually or very soon making decisions on those and putting those into policies. I'm sorry there. I remained on mute a little too long than I should have. I apologize to everyone in the audience. But I just wanted to thank Brooks for that statement. Um, I think it's important for all of us to do a good job of defining what is a mandate versus what is a recommendation and really over communicating that to our community. I think we've all seen a lot of the contention uh, that's been broadcast in the media as it relates to masks in public and at restaurants and retail locations. And we can expect some of that in the coming school year. So the sooner these decisions are made and more importantly communicated to parents and members of the community, I think we'll all be doing ourselves a favor as we approach this challenge. Um, great question. And Brian, and, and just Brian, just to Please put a, a wrap on that real quick. The, yeah, sorry. The um, just to, to just to emphasize this point is that each district w will have their own definition of what is best for their, for their situation. So I would just emphasize that. Don't take this as uh, every guideline must be implemented in your situation. So I, th I think it's taking into consideration and then determining what's best for you and your families. And really that's going to be, I think, an individual or case-by-case -case decision at the end of the day. Excellent. Outstanding, Brooks. So we've had 92 questions come in in the 42 minutes we've been on. So obviously a lot of excitement and energy um, around this topic, but we want to uh, carry on. We're going to have two more question and answer sessions. And we're going to stay here for as long as we possibly can until the technology boots us off, which is 90 minutes. So if you all have time, uh, we all have time, and we'll stay here and try to work through all these questions. Um, so please be patient with us as we carry on through this. Uh, we've put a lot of thought and energy into this, and we certainly want to answer all your questions because there's dozens of great ones out there we just don't have time to get to. Before we move on to our next topic, which is communications, right? And um, this was always an important tool. Um, now, with more nervous parents and community members and superintendents and school boards, it's just going to be amplified. So what can we do to over-communicate in this COVID era? Yeah, Brian. So, you know, a couple of things we'll talk about here on communications, and uh, and we'll, we'll hustle through a little bit of, of my stuff because uh, I think ultimately, um, you know, what Josh is doing and, and will be doing with the technology uh, you all definitely want to hear about. So there's there's three pieces here. There's the bus, there's the student, and then there's messaging to parents. So uh, here comes the bus. You know that that's our tool. I'm sure you've if you haven't heard of that, you've you've seen other apps out there that uh, let you know when the bus is coming. It's always been powerful. It's always been helpful. You know, it takes the the little bit of the chaos out of the morning, right? And then cuts down on some phone calls. Uh, but now more than ever. So if you have to change your routes, if you have to double back, if you have to jump through all these hoops to to actually go get the kids to school, I'm guessing that timing is going to be different, right? So my 7.30 bus stop five days a week may no longer be 7.30 five days a week. Maybe it's 7 on Monday and 10 on Tuesday and not at all on Wednesday. And, you know, I've heard lots of scenarios. But as a parent, I'd like to know when that bus is coming, right, because I know it's going to be pretty dynamic. The second piece of that puzzle, ridership status. So now we're talking about the kids, the students. So going back to the whole idea of, of student contact tracing, you know, kids that are scanning on and off a bus so we know who's on and, and who's not, well, as a parent, I can now have that additional level of detail. So I might not be home at 3 o'clock when that, that bus arrives. 
but I can get a notification that my 13-year-old scanned off, and that gives me a little you know, sense of, uh, of comfort, right? So the bus status is great. The student status is even more helpful, and I know that they made it to school or made it home. And last but not least, the messaging. So um, I'm guessing you, you're probably going to need to communicate more, right, to parents. So there's a messaging component as well that, frankly, can be used for anything, right, for, from as simple as, hey, bus 10's running a few minutes late, to, you know, the kids are, are held up at school because there was an incident. They're all going to be 20 minutes late, you know, my, my 10 buses that serve the middle school. Um, to potentially, you know, COVID-related. We, we don't know how much you want to share. We don't know how much you should share. But you do have a, a path into that parent and into that community for communication. So I think Josh can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how he's been using these tools, and, and we'll start with the, the bus arrival. Thanks, Brad. Uh, so bus arrival status is is a great tool. Um, if you want something that's going to cut down on phone calls to your dispatch office, uh, this is it. It definitely allows parents and students to um, get alerts, push alerts on their phone, or see where the bus is in relation to their bus stop. And what's great about this is it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, parents and students can set up how far in advance they want to receive the notification uh, when a bus hits a certain point. Um, our special needs uh, families love it, particularly with the autistic students, because they can mentally prepare the students for the bus arrival um, rather than anticipate the arrival and try to predict when it's coming. So um, it is a great tool. Um, one way that I think this can help in the age of COVID is some of our buses obviously may be running late. It'll cut down on phone calls, but also it'll prevent um, students from congregating at bus stops for extended period of time because they can stay in their homes and wait until they get the alert that the bus is on final approach. So I think that's a tool that'll definitely help us. Thank you, Josh, that's, that's excellent. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next slide now focused on ridership status. And as you'll see at this point, we've, we've put a couple of uh, uh, icons up to show how this relates to Bus Guardian. And you're, you're free at any point to visit busguardian.com to learn more about this tool as it relates to the contact tracing and the hygiene verification. Um, Josh now is gonna talk a little bit about um, ridership and the bus alerts to the parents and how those all kind of tie together. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So ridership status, um, I kind of touched on briefly as well when we do the, the list of who is riding our buses, we'll know who is on there. Um, it does cut, cut down on uh, some of the legwork that you have to do in transportation as far as maximizing and running efficiently on the routes. But the one piece that I, I like most about this, and as do the drivers, is um, as students are scanning on and off the bus, uh, we do get alerts as to whether they're on the correct bus or not, um, which could obviously save a potential issue down the road. And uh, they did add a feature recently, which, which we like that if they do try to scan off, scan onto the wrong bus, that the driver from their tablet is actually able to look up and see which bus they should be riding so they can redirect them to the correct bus, which saves a lot of radio traffic on the two-way radios between the buses uh, contacting dispatch. Um, so it is a, it's a great, great thing. Um, parents are also able to see where their students get off the bus. So if they do go to a friend's house and get off at a stop early or a stop behind, we're aware of it, and the parents, uh, if they're registered for the app, are also getting an alert as to where their child got off at. Outstanding, Josh. Thank you for that. Uh, moving right along, the messaging feature, which in the past has been kind of a quiet add-on, uh, we think will provide tremendous value now in this COVID era where busing realities could change day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, and the ability to reach out to um, parents via the app, which we know they're tuned into. Um, we have 500,000 daily active users during the school year. So we know parents are using the app and, and it can be a great way to, to message them. Josh, can you talk about um, the way you've messaged parents and the way you use this in your community? 
Sure, yeah. So this tool um, allows you to either email or send a push alert to parents, depending on what the, the parent has selected when they enrolled. Um, we use it, um, I would say, sparingly, just, just for the, the sense that we don't want to overwhelm the parents with a bunch of, bunch of messages and have them uninstall the app. Um, but we've used it in our district prior to COVID um, to remind parents of an early release schedule. Um, maybe there's a bus breakdown and we'll say, uh, please have your students remain at the bus stop. Um, unfortunately, if there's an accident or something, we may use it. We've also had a unique situation where we had um, a behavior issue on the bus that we just couldn't isolate using the cameras. And I, I did send a message out to all the the parents of the students that rode that bus and just ask them to talk to their students when they got home that afternoon and was actually shocked. I got flooded with uh, emails and phone calls from parents who had spoken to their children and were, you know, they were giving names and we were able to, to solve our issue real quick. So it worked well for that. Uh, when you're sending messages, you could send them out district wide. You can sort them by school. You can narrow it down by the bus and then even go as specific to the bus route or bus stop. So it's a, a real versatile tool. And, and Josh, thank you again. It's, it's you know, we, we practiced this slide presentation several times to make sure we gave uh, the hundreds of you that are joining us the best possible production. And never did you mention that anecdote about um, using it to solve uh, behavior issues on the bus. And what we love seeing is when our customers find ways to use our technology that we would never have dreamed of ourselves and to create a safer environment for students, right? I mean, that's going back to the initial slide we showed of the parents waiting for the school bus. Um, that's what it's all about at the end of the day is helping parents and families have that sense of security and peace that their kids are safe in this, this really uncertain world that we live in. So it's anecdotes like that that Josh shared that we're just you know, thrilled to hear about when people use our technology and start conversations at home and solve uh, behavior problems. It's just uh, you know, we never, never thought of that when we're developing the product, so it's neat to hear uh, today. Uh, moving on to the next round of Q&A. We've got a lot more questions coming in from across the country. So, um, Josh, um, a question around PPE for drivers. Uh, where have you thought about this, and what have you all explored? Is that on your radar at all? Um, absolutely. That's a big piece of it. Um, our county that, that our district is in actually is requiring face masks anywhere in public right now. So that decision has been made for us. Once that um, executive order expires, it's something that the district will have to look at as to whether it's going to remain required or recommended for our buses. We did, um, as a district, purchase masks for our drivers, reusable masks, as well as all of our employees. And we went one step further and purchased uh, face shields for our special needs drivers and aides mainly because those are the ones that are going to be in close proximity to students when they're securing a wheelchair or helping with a seatbelt or harness. So we wanted to uh, give them a little more protection. Um, additionally, our SPED department had said that face shields might be a little more comforting to SPED students because they can still see the employee's mouth and facial expressions. So that's kind of how uh, the approach we're taking here at Higley. Excellent. Uh, great question there. Um, here's a tough question, and I'm, I'm not sure how we can answer this, but I'm going to throw it out there uh, to Brad on our team. Uh, is the app, is the Here Comes the Bad app, going to be able to differentiate between uh, Johnny's bus only coming on certain days and certain times for a hybrid schedule? Yeah, great question. Tough one, right? So if, if you're going to the same place five days a week, kind of easy to, to monitor that from the tech side. Um, but so if Johnny's bus coming on certain days and times on a hybrid schedule, we call that day variance. So the way our system works is uh, in a best case scenario, you have a routing system. We integrate with that routing system. So we'll do a nightly download of all the routes and, and runs and tiers uh, or a couple times a day, depending on how often you're making those changes. Uh, but the short answer is yes. So if, you know, our golden rule is uh, if, uh, if this, the information's in the routing system and you have it in your routing system, right, Monday here, Tuesday there, Wednesday there, then yes, our system will read that. If you don't, 
then we're going to read whatever's in there. If you don't have a routing system, we actually have uh, uh, an updated version of Here Comes the Bus where parents actually can choose those alerts and set them up themselves. So depending on what your situation is, if you have a routing system, if you don't, if you have that data, if you don't, we've got uh, a solution in, uh, in most cases. Excellent. Thanks for that, Brad. Brooks, we've got a, a couple of questions here on policy that feels like a, a fit for you. Um, it says, shouldn't it be mandated that all students riding the bus wear face masks? How, how are your uh, clients that you're consulting with approaching the mandate around face masks on the bus? Yeah, Brian, I, I mean, I think, again, it's an individual decision, um, and the the community kind of helps shape that, that decision process. So, you know, from our, from our perspective, we are recommending that um, students wear a mask on the bus, but you know, the the actual um, decisions are, are up to that district. So I, I think it is from a safety perspective and from a um, overall operational perspective. If we're able to get students on the bus with masks and get a few more students on the bus and safely distance them, um, I think that is a, a good outcome. Uh, but the decision to make that really, you know, that that's an individual school district decision. We can't, you know, I, I wish we could blanket say everyone needs to do this, but I think based on our, you know, our current uh, situation, that's just not, not going to happen. Well, thank you, Brooks. We have a ton of questions, and I'm, I'm looking at the uh, clock now, and it's moved rapidly towards the top of the hour, and we want to be respectful of time and make sure we get our full presentation in here. So we're going to move quickly to the next one. Um, we've had a lot of questions about, is this available after uh, School Bus Fleet will continue to host this on their website? So yes, you can go back and listen to this two, three times or share it with other people in your department, uh, school leaders and so on to make sure they receive this message and some of the tips that Josh and Brooks and Brad have provided. Um, so yes, you will be able to get this after the fact. Um, on to the next slide, uh, route management in the era of COVID. And Brad, can you address this rapidly so we can move on to Brooks? <laughs> sure thing. Uh, let's try and do this in uh, maybe 60 to 90 seconds. How about that? So route management, right? It's going to be, well, it's hard as is. It's always been hard. It's going to be even more difficult when you have to adjust routes, make changes, uh, alter capacities, go back, double, you know, double run down the same neighborhood to get the same amount of kids and, and so on. So the short version, um, you know, you need a tool that can help you see what your plan looks like compared to what's actually happening. So plan versus actual routes. I plan it to look one way. Are they driving it that way, right, especially if those, are, those routes are changing pretty readily. Uh, yard departure status. So, you know, in the mornings with all the staggered schedules that you're going to have to have, it's going to be probably dicey to make sure all those buses get on route, especially if you think about, you know, the driver shortage problem that everyone has had for as long as I've been <laughs> working with the industry, it's going to be different now, right? Uh, there's a lot more consideration. So making sure those buses get out there, the driver's checked into the bus, the bus is you know, running and it's off the lot, it's going to be even more critical. So a tool to manage that. And uh, last but not least, school arrival status. So you know, we were talking about this the other day, and I'm sure you all have thought about this, but uh, so you let's say – you know, by, by some small miracle, you get all the buses to school on time for that first tier, okay? We're looking good. Then you have to offload the students, right? Then you, you know, the students will probably have to have uh, some sort of process at the school, and there's going to be probably some time impact on loading and unloading at the school, which never existed, right? Whether it's two minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, who knows? Uh, add to that the additional cars, <laughs> they're going to be all over the parking lot because parents might want to take their kids to school. So all that being said, there's going to be a lot of variable uh, uh, input at the school level. So being able to monitor that school arrival status and share that with the schools. So if I'm the principal at the high school, I would love to have access to a screen that shows me, are my buses here? Have they arrived? Do I have to hold the bell? Do I you know, send everybody out there? You're going to need that information, uh, not only from transportation, but at the administrative side, right? So if, if I know all the buses are here, I can release the kids, right? And that, that's probably going to be staggered. Maybe it's all at once. Maybe it's half and half. We don't know. But you need that information and you need to be able to share it. So let's, uh, 
Well, let's throw it over to Brooks for a little bit, Brian, and he can talk about um, you know the, the school start planning and um, you know with all this information that we've been sharing, we hope it's helpful. But at the end of the day, uh, as Brooks has said, this is going to be a, a case by case scenario. So uh, we invited him here to share a little bit about what he's doing with some of his uh, school districts today. Yeah, thanks, Brad. So in addition to our consulting services, we manage over 15 school districts, including the state of Hawaii. So, so once COVID, uh, the once the COVID shutdown took place, we realized that we needed a way to manage all the operational issues and questions. So there was a flood of COVID recommendations and guidance coming out. So we decided to kind of take charge and develop our own uh, what we call a school start planning tool. So we, we've developed both a uh, a decision-making framework and school start checklist that's integrated into a web-based uh, platform. And our, our intent was to help districts to control what you can control, first of all. Right? So determine what variables you can control and focus on the items that you can make progress on, progress on now while continuing to push for answers to larger questions. So you know, don't get stuck on the things that you're, you, the big picture things or things that you can't answer because there's gonna be all, whole host of other things that you're going to need to address. And, uh, you know, once we rolled this out to our managers, they all to a person, so it was incredibly helpful to think through all the different questions, things they never thought of. So, you know, starting with a decision-making decision -making framework, uh, it will allow basically a holistic review of the organization, assess all your operational challenges, opportunities, and risks in areas where either uh, costs can be controlled or reduced, uh, during during your startup press, uh, preparation. Um, I think it's important to mention that transportation right now cannot make silo decisions. So traditionally, tradi we know that transportation is always last to the table, running to get things done. I think that this year, the it just cannot be that way. Uh, I think that we need to be pushing forward our issues to leadership and working closely on policies and decisions uh, regarding a safe return to school. So, you know, our thought is don't wait, ask the right questions. Uh, our framework includes over 130 questions that fall into the core transportation areas. Uh, so those are listed here in, our, in that second bullet under school start checklist and management. So our, our decision-making framework and checklist covers all of those areas. Um, and so just kind of highlighting a couple of those real quick, if you think about the think about drivers, uh, you know, implementing a process to survey drivers and staff to ad identify high risk employees. Um, you know, I think right now, uh, if you're not communicating to your drivers every week and getting a sense for who is going to be coming back or not, or doing some internal risk management, then you're probably behind. Um, our thought is that while we've been in a long standing uh, driver shortage the that is going to evolve and and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that the driver shortage is going to end but the old driver shortage is not going to be the new driver shortage so i think that school districts should push driver recruitment right now and assess if changes in the economy have impacted the driver candidate pool with with covid continuing to linger having a good sized pool of new drivers it could be imperative to delivering service this fall so um, if you've tried recruiting efforts in the past and they haven't worked, I would encourage you to try it again. Use your different communication vehicles that you have within your, your power to communicate that message that you're recruiting drivers. And I would make that, a, a, a not a focal point, but a piece of your plan. Um, also, kind of looking at the fleet management, uh, there's been a lot of vehicles probably sitting around. Uh, so thinking about vehicle inspections, PMs, major repairs, Anything that hasn't been done yet, getting those efforts started is critical right now in figuring out the state of your fleet before you get too close to school start. And from a, from a routing perspective, um, like I mentioned earlier, determining what additional time is needed due to cleaning and updating a route scheme to reflect those policy decisions. So this will create another set of tasks that you know, parents must be informed of changes to bus capacity and schedules. And with safety and training, I will mention, if you just think about the scope of that, you know, developing new policies and procedures and then training your staff on all of those new policies and procedures. So you need to give yourself time to, one, think about the policies you need, developing those policies, and then implementing those policies. So from a uh, 
So our approach, again, is to start with asking questions and then turning those questions into actions in the form of a school start checklist. And what we're providing is a, a solution to manage all that and support to, to manage that process. And the third piece of that would be your COVID scenario modeling. And, you know, if you guys, anyone on here is a client of Synovia, you're probably going to be in really good shape because you're going to have bus capacity and utilization data that's organized and ready for analysis. Uh, we go to some clients and they just don't know their capacity, they don't know the bus schedules uh, as well as they might in, in other regions. So if you're ready, if you have, have that data ready and you're ready to assess it, great. If not, I would start pulling that data together and making some good assumptions about your bus capacity levels. I think you should start with a few plausible school start scenarios. And once you start to uh, map these out, you're going to see that, hey, we can only trans transport X amount of students, right? So determining the max and min number of students that can be safely transported. And then there's kind of that next piece of developing alternatives slash what I would call creative strategies. What else can we do to get students to school? Should we, should we look at third-party transportation providers? What can we do in terms of uh, 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 other resources of getting kids to school through safe walking areas or increased biking. So there's all these different areas to start considering around your situation, but you can't get to that level of thinking until you start doing some scenario modeling and those issues present themselves and you go through the, the, pro, the, pro, the process of coming up with answers. So, you know, we're, we're available to be a partner. We're, we're giving uh, this startup sheet uh, away. We have a free version and we have a, a paid version that we're happy to, to talk to you about and, and, and help you with your school start planning and support under this uh, very unusual circumstances. Brooks Brinkus, I apologize. I got a bit nervous in the beginning and, and failed on your name at the opening, but I think you more than made up for my error with that uh, extraordinarily detailed uh, list and really methodology for uh, the things a school bus fleet can do as they, as they go back to school. Um, Brooks said they have the free version of this decision-making framework. If anyone is interested, mm -hmm. just put that in the question right now that you're interested in this framework, and we will email that to you. I have it right now on my desktop ready to be sent out to anyone. Um, I spent some time reviewing it last night, and for a free version, it is pretty robust. It will really help you think about all the different questions that need to be asked as, uh, as schools go back in session, and I think we'll, we'll generate some interesting brainstorming in your department. So, Brooks, thank you very much for making that available um, to everyone on this call. Yep, no problem, and, and we're here to answer any questions as well. Excellent. So, so moving on to the next slide, um, you know, we talked about three big challenges, right? Student and driver safety, uh, communications, both with the parent and the student, and route management. And uh, we talked about what we believe are three trusted, proven, uh, you know, in the field solutions that can help the fleets tackle these. Um, the first being Bus Guardian, uh, which can do the contact tracing and the hygiene verification. Uh, we are offering that now for $15 per vehicle per month uh, as part of our COVID uh, back-to-school uh, pricing. Uh, for people that come on board here during the COVID era, uh, essentially before the start of the new year, it's going to be $15 per bus per month around the, uh, the bus guardian. Um, the Here Comes the Bus, uh, it's been out for five years. It's a well-proven, over 2 million users. Um, that is, is also a great tool to, to help with your parent tracking, excuse me, bus tracking for the parent and as well as the communication. And then the route monitoring has been a product that we've uh, relied on for many years with our customers. Um, they've used for principals and teachers to also track the arrival and departure of buses from both the school and the yard. Um, we've still got hundreds and hundreds of you online because we've got so many great questions. So we're going to stay here for 21 more minutes until it shuts us off and try to work through as many of these questions as possible because there's just, uh, well, 200 of them at this point. Um, so we're going to take a look at these and give me a second um, to try to figure out uh, the next great question. Um, 
There's quite a few about uh, temperature monitoring. Yeah, thank you. Temperature, mo thank you, uh, Brad. Temperature monitoring. Uh, we know it's been discussed. We know it's being used in retail and in other workplaces. I think it's a great one first. Uh, Josh, can you talk about if you guys explored this? And then Brooks, can you talk about what you're seeing kind of nationwide from a temperature taking perspective? Yeah, sure, Brian. Um, obviously, that's something that we did look at here in Higley, as well as many other districts across the state of Arizona. The consensus I'm seeing from a lot of uh, districts in Arizona, at least, is that it's just not feasible for a bus driver to check the temperature of a student prior to boarding, um, a number of, of reasons for that. The bus driver has other responsibilities. They need to be uh, watching traffic around the bus, maybe students crossing the street. Secondly, and probably more importantly, is if a, if a child does have a temperature, the bus driver really can't just push them away and send them home, possibly to an empty house and drive away. So in our district, um, at least at this point, that's not something we're considering. It would something that would be taking place uh, once they arrive at the school campus. Yeah, and Josh, we're kind of seeing similar uh, across the country. I think there are some districts where they have the luxury of maybe some uh, the budget to invest in some of these tools. Um, there is some uh, temperature check systems going into the front of schools that we've seen, and I've seen others discussing uh, taking temperatures before the kids get on the bus. So I think, you know, the, the Cadillac version, there's obviously some Cadillac software out there, technology that can do uh, thermal scanning. Um, I think the challenge with that is, you know, just <laughs> the number, the, the, the dollars that, that are involved. So, you know, hopefully that is not going to be an impediment to anyone getting that technology, but I think um, it, there is technologies available and, and we can provide some of those that we've seen, but I think it's going to come down to, you know, just a prioritization of investments. Thank you, Josh and Brooks. Yeah, this is certainly, I think, like the mask issue, going to vary wild, uh, widely from district to district, uh, city to city, state to state. But um, it's something I think we can continue to see on the uh, on the radar into the future because of, you know, temperature being one of the few easily uh, uh, acquired uh, symptoms that helps people kind of weed out the positives from the negatives in real time. Um, we've got some questions around funding. Um, for those of you not aware, it's been in the media quite a bit, but you probably should be aware that, you know, as part of uh, the government's initial stimulus plan, uh, the CARES Act was passed that set aside $13 billion of stimulus money that was to go directly towards K-12 education. Uh, we've been watching that uh, very closely, knowing that some of that would flow down to transportation. And we've been hearing anecdotally from some of our customers that transportation has received some of that money and they're looking to use it uh, to invest in Bus Guardian. We've had a customer in South Carolina, another one in Florida specifically, who came to us and said, um, we have CARES Act money, which, by the way, if it's not used by December 31 of this year, disappears. So um, there's the very real incentive to use this money promptly. Um, I know a lot of people are concerned about the funding issue and, you know, cities and counties and states uh, taking in less revenue because of all the um, sales tax revenue being impacted by all the closures. Um, but there is this CARES Act money. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure we're having those high-level conversations with superintendents and controllers and um, anyone else who controls revenue because um, $13 billion was injected into K-12 budgets nationwide. Um, if just 10% of that goes to transportation, that's over a billion dollars out there. So um, we do believe there is funding. Anecdotally, we've already heard from, uh, from just a handful of customers that they have CARES Act money that they're looking to spend very rapidly. So we urge all of you on this call to, to look up the CARES Act, become familiar with it. Um, if you dig into your state or your local municipality in some areas, they've actually published how much school districts are actually receiving. We've been able to find that data without doing too much hard digging because Google's a terrific tool. So uh, we know funding's an issue. It always is as it relates to school transportation. But we believe uh, some of this CARES Act money, whether it's for Bus Guardian or for some of the chemicals you'll need or for masks or for driver PPE, um, 
there is money out there that the federal government has allocated because they recognize that students going back to school safely will be one of the most important predicates to really getting our society and economy back to where it was before this entire pandemic situation began. Uh, next question is more of a technical question around the software. So the question is, uh, is the Bus Guardian program uh, additional to or is it part of your core mapping GPS tracking system, Brad? Yes, thanks, Brian. So um, I guess the answer is kind of both. <laughs> so, you know, historically we have uh, probably six or seven modules, you know, within our, our application from basic bus tracking to everything you heard today. And, and what we decided, you know, very recently was we wanted to package um, basically most of what we do uh, in the hopes that this will help address the challenges that, are, that you all are up against. So if you're a current customer and you don't have some of this technology, it can easily be added. If you're not a customer, then it's a package that we have now put together called Bus Guardian with you know, specific features and pricing, as Brian had mentioned. Um, so yeah, that, that's why I said it's a little bit of both, depending on you know, if you have part of our solution today or not. Outstanding. Thank you for that. Um, we've talked about taking temperatures. We've talked about some of the chemicals. Um, Josh, you talked about this, about carrying the chemicals on the bus. Can you go back to that point real briefly and, and just dig a little bit deeper on that point? Um, you know, is hydrogen peroxide flammable? I mean, how does that work in, in terms of, um, you know, do drivers have to go into the yard to use it or is it on the actual bus? Yeah, absolutely. I can clarify that a little bit. Uh, the hydrogen peroxide cleaner that, that we're looking at is not flammable. Uh, so that's not an issue for us. Um, however, our state uh, DPS that regulates school buses um, does not like chemicals to be stored in the same compartment as uh, students. So uh, in the past, we've been allowing the drivers to have wipes on the bus, but no Windex, no spray bottles. That's all done back at the yard. That doesn't necessarily work with what we're trying to accomplish with the uh, uh, killing of the virus and, and needing to sanitize the bus more often. So we're taking kind of a unique approach while we're waiting for our state to decide whether chemicals are going to be allowed on the bus or certain chemicals. And so what what we're considering doing at Higley is, is essentially having a sanitation station set up at each uh, bus bay to where when the, the buses pull in and drop off the students, either a custodian or someone else from the school can bring that product to the driver and allow them to use it right uh, there and then leave it at the school and drive away. So I think it's going to, uh, like Brooks said, it's going to vary state to state and district to district and maybe even county by county. But uh, if you think outside the box, you can oftentimes come up with solutions that will end up working. Uh, excellent answer, as always. And, and um the chemical solution, uh, we got a good question here that I had not thought of. Um, is there risk of exposure uh, for the drivers if they're you know, around this stuff, the odor or uh, other parts of the chemical? Is there any, you know, it's one thing to be around it for a few minutes, but if you're a driver and around it for hours, is there any risk? Uh, another great question. Um, Time will kind of tell, but we've been doing uh, testing with our special needs drivers that are currently driving for us over the summer. Um, the product that we're uh, currently using is colorless and odorless. Um, it looks just like water that they're spraying, um, and essentially it's hydrogen peroxide, which I believe 3% um, hydrogen peroxide is what the CDC is recommending, and I think this product's like a 3.6% hydrogen peroxide, which, as you all know, is, is fairly safe um, product that's readily available by uh, most drugstores, and some people, you know, swish it in their mouth for different reasons as well. So it's a fairly safe product. Outstanding. And one more question for you, Josh. Someone put the disclaimer that this is a silly question, but I have to disagree. I think this is a great question. Um, snacking. What was your policy pre-COVID, post-COVID? Has snacking on the bus been impacted by this at all? Um, it is a good question. Um, 
DPS, again, who regulates buses in Arizona, does not allow food or drink to be consumed by the students while they are on the bus. Uh, the only exception in Arizona is they can have a plastic water bottle or a thermal flask of some sort, just no glass bottles, but they are allowed to consume water. Um, and that's the only uh, food and drink we allow on the bus. And just to, I see there was one other question that I can uh, jump on real quick is, is another consideration if you do keep the chemicals on your bus, um, you are also required to have the MSDS sheets on each vehicle that has that chemical. Uh, so if you if your jurisdiction does allow you to have the chemicals, make sure you, you uh, include that MSDS sheet on every bus in case there's an issue. Excellent, Josh. Thank you. And, and I think this question is, I'm going to give it first to Brooks and then to Josh and then over to Brad. It's just one word, and the question is confidentiality. I'm going to assume that is around the contact tracing element, right? We're all aware of HIPAA and the need to uh, safeguard uh, people's health information, and that's for very good reason. Um, but in this contact tracing COVID world, I think we also recognize the need to know we've been around people who are really sick in the last little bit and if we've had close contact with them. So, um, Brooks, what are you recommending around this in terms of confidentiality as it relates to HIPAA? And what are you seeing? And then, and then uh, specifically, Josh, can you answer after Brooks? Um, have you guys put anything in writing, codified any sort of confidentiality uh, in terms of contacting parents um, around COVID contact tracing? Yeah, and, and I'll just say on this part, Brian, I think that the trick here is knowing what is uh, protected by law and then what is what is going to be um, just uncomfortable or not uh, approved by your community and, and parents, right? So there's the HIPAA and there's data uh, protection. You know, you, you can't have addresses, phone numbers, you know, PII, personal information on public uh, websites and information. So you have to do the minimum. Uh, I think beyond that, and I, I, I feel like a little bit like a broken record, but it has to be, you know, you're up to your leadership and your community, what you're comfortable sharing or, or having in your systems beyond uh, the law requirements. So I, I'll defer to Josh on, on how he kind of handles those, those gray areas. Yeah, I agree, Brooks. Um... I personally, at least in Higley, would not send out any kind of uh, messaging to parents unless directed um, by our district office and, and even have them provide the exact wording that would be in the message. Um, and I would assume it would be uh, very generic. It wouldn't list any student names. It may just say that your child was mm -hmm. uh, riding a bus that may have had a student with the virus. Please contact the school nurse or, you know, wherever it is, and it would, that would be about the extent of it. I would think the majority of the more detailed communication would come directly from the school or the district office. That's excellent. Yeah, I mean, w when I approach these things, as, as we approach Bus Guardian and put the contact tracing tool together and we're thinking about how we talk to prospects and customers about it, I relied on something that, that I learned uh, many moons ago that if you – uh, present reasonable people with reasonable information, they will respond reasonably uh, most of the time. And I think that's what I just heard Josh there say is, you know, there's the sense that you could send out information essentially saying your child may have been in contact with an ill child. I think most reasonable parents would like to know that, and they would take the reasonable action to follow up the school and learn more. And you can do these things while protecting children's uh, personal information, their health data, but also, you know, provide the community service they expect you to. Um, I think we all saw horror stories when this virus first happened about uh, different stores or um, restaurants or even workplaces that knew they had an outbreak but didn't communicate it. Um, I think there was a whole bunch of concern around legal liability when all of this first started. I think we've seen a lot of that uh, diminish as people have realized that they're going to cause a lot more problems by not sharing it than they will by sharing it. Uh, in terms of uh, communicating with the public and um, the great lengths we've all gone to as a society, right, in shutting down our economy and our schools and, um, you know, all of us working from home and doing the things we've done, um, there is the sense that we need to continue to act reasonably after we've taken such draconian measures to keep all of us safe uh, in this era. 
Uh, we've got six minutes left and a lot more questions, so uh, I'm going to keep going because we still have hundreds of you on the call, and we really appreciate you being patient with us. Um, air conditioning on the buses. Josh, you speak about this a little bit. Could you go back and just dig deeper into the air conditioning thought? You know, we've got a lot of customers in North Carolina and in Georgia where they might use air conditioning on buses for seven, eight months of the year. Um, and you said you might run the air conditioning of the windows open. Um, you know, what is the considerations we should think about as it relates to, you know, ventilation, both, I guess, air conditioning and, for that matter, heating uh, on buses? Would you, would you keep the windows open in the winter and heating? How would you approach that, Josh? Um, sure, Brian. I can kind of share with you our thoughts. Um, I've been meeting with several directors in our state, and, and one of them's fairly versed in, and a former mechanic, and he had brought up that, you know, in your car, you have the option for recirculate or fresh air intake. Most of your larger buses that have uh, air conditioning are 100% uh, recirculated air, which means uh, it's just pulling the air from inside the bus, cooling it, and pushing it right back out, which could essentially mean that if the virus is on the bus, it's just going to keep circulating through the bus and getting pushed throughout the, the vehicle. So. In Arizona, we have had talks about um, cracking a couple windows in the front of the bus and the rear of the bus to allow additional airflow into the bus, knowing that the bus won't be as cool, um, but at least we're getting additional airflow into the bus. Um, you may laugh at this, but all of our buses do have heaters, and we rarely use them. Most of the time, our heater valves are shut off year-round because even in the wintertime, uh, the weather's pretty nice here. But I would imagine the same... Uh, thing would hold true with your heaters that are under the seats. They're just pulling in the same air from inside the bus. There is no fresh air getting pulled in. Um, so I would assume in the winter time that might be something that districts want to consider as well, uh, leaving the additional airflow coming into the vehicle. Excellent. And then another one for Josh. Um, I, I never thought of this, and you might see this in Higley. How do you monitor students who ride multiple buses as it relates to the student contact tracing? And, excuse me, the ridership exactly. Um, good question. We um, have several students that have dual households. They may have uh, mom and dad separated, so they live in two different households. What uh, we've done to make it easier for us and for the students is we actually issue them two bus passes, uh, one for mom's house, one for dad's house. and. Um, have normally it's the older students and we have the parents uh, understand that it's the responsibility of the child to know which bus they need to ride on which day um, we don't track that for them but that's uh, one of the ways uh, we've overcome that issue of dual households and I think there was another question in there about um, what if a student has a note to get off at a different bus stop um, and I can touch on that briefly as well in using the Synovia uh, tablet if a student does try to scan off at the wrong bus stop, it'll alert the driver through an audio tone as well as a red screen. And then the driver has the option to either deny the student getting off or allowing them to get off. So if they had a note, the driver would just hit allow and then Synovia would record that the student did get off at a, at a different stop. Josh, we have 90 seconds left until we're going to be shut off. So it's incumbent that I do a couple of housekeeping things. First, foremost, and uh, most deeply is thank you uh, for the incredible amount of research, thoughtfulness, and um, preparation you put into this. I know you're very busy getting ready for school. We had several practice sessions where we got our story straight and made sure we told the best possible uh, story around our technology and the way you use it. Um, so, Josh, you, Josh, I thank you on behalf of Synovia, on behalf of CalAMP, and certainly on behalf of the more than 600 um, participants who logged into this presentation. If you'd like a copy of these slides, say so right now. Say, give me the slides in the questions, and we can also send you the slides that you can use to think about um, on top of the framework as well. So the, the big things to take away are... Um, Bus Guardian is available now for $15 a month as an introductory price. That is the COVID-ready tool. Um, and that you can get a copy of the framework from Brooks or the slides from us by answering in the next 30 seconds. 
on the question, just requesting that, and we'll be happy to send it out. Um, in our final few seconds, thank you everyone who joined. We know you're very busy and you have a huge challenge in front of you, and we hope we've provided some expertise and some help as you face this Herculean challenge that we all, all are relying on to help get our lives back to normal. So with that, I will turn it back to our friends at School Bus Fleet. Thank you, Brian. So we hope that you all enjoyed today's webinar. I want to again thank Brian Mitchell, Josh Crosby, Brooks Brankis, Brad Bishop, and Synovia Solutions for today's presentation. I also want to mention that this webinar will be available on demand on the School Bus Fleet website at schoolbusfleet.com webinars. Thank you and have a great day.